Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. I know it's exam week, and yeah. clearly people have no interest in studying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they well, use any excuse to get yeah. out of them. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for providing that distraction. Sure. Um, so as I, as I said at the, um, the end of my introduction, uh, one of your most recent projects is uh, Final Portrait, which uh -huh. you wrote and directed, and that came out um, earlier this year. Um, you haven't directed for uh, 10 years um, mm -hmm. before doing this. So what was so special about this project which brought you back into that role, and why, why was this of such interest to you? Well, I love Alberto Giacometti. Uh, if any of you know who he is, he's a great artist of the early part of the 20th century. He was a painter and sculptor, and his sculptures, um, and it, it, I think his, a sculpture, Man Pointing, sold for $141 million, which is a, a record for any Although that's not the reason we should uh, admire him. The reason we should admire him is, and I do admire him, is because he was a prolific artist, um, but he probably was one of the most um, articulate artists of the 20th century about the creative process itself. And <clears throat> he lived a life of what one might consider true bohemianism, um, uh, but only remained true to, to his work and was constantly sort of trying to find the truth in his work, which is, which to me is, a, is the most admirable, admirable thing any artist, any artist can do. Now, I, I, I wrote the film, I started writing the film about 14 years ago. And it took a very long time to bring it to fruition. So, um, but that's because it's an independent, you know, a sort of yeah. small, independent, rather esoteric film. Um, but I did not direct a film for 10 years for, uh, well, for a number of reasons, but yeah. Sure, okay. And you were at the um, Ashmolean Museum earlier looking around one of the exhibitions. Yeah. Where did your um, interest in art come from? came from my father, who was an artist, an art teacher, taught high school art for many years. And in the 1960s and 70s, early 80s, the art programs in what we call public schools, which are pu not a private school, but a public school, um, uh, um, he, uh, the, there was a lot of emphasis put on, put on the arts. As America became more conservative, that changed very distinctly in the 1980s and has been um, sort of f in free fall uh, ever since. But arts programs then were very well funded, uh, very well looked after, and an integral part of the curriculum. Uh, so being a part of that growing up, watching him teach, going to some of his classes in the summer, even during the school year, was uh, incredibly influen influential for me. Uh, and having lived in Florence for a year when I was about 14, 13, 13 years old, was equally as, as influential. So art was a really, really important aspect of my, of my upbringing. Yeah, sure. Do you feel, um, you know, the arts in education today, they're, they're coming under quite a lot of threat, you know, in the national curriculum? Uh, and everywhere else. Do you think it's something that we should be putting more, um, you know, as a parent yourself, is it something we should be putting more priority on, you know, having access to arts, you know, theatre, going to galleries? At yeah, I, th age? I think there's no question. I think that art, uh, I feel that art is not an adjunct to society, but, but as I said, an integral part of it. The, the, the fact that we consider it as it's the first thing that we cut, we cut it before sports programs, we cut it before a anything. And it's not, it's, not given, um, it's not given equal weight. And we're, we're meant to, in, in teaching, we're, 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 students are meant to think in rather linear ways. And mathematics, um, the sciences, uh, languages, great. OK, great. But why is, why is art not, not their equal? I don't understand. When so many people have creative impulses and they are squelched, basically after the age of five, let's say about five, it starts to disappear. It no longer becomes important. And suddenly people are struggling to find a way to get excited about math or get excited about, I know you're a, a, I'm chemist. a chemist. I know. <laughs> I know. But and, th and I think that a lot of people growing up suddenly feel out of place. They're always slightly unsure, and then suddenly 
when they're older, they go get a job, they do something, they're not really very happy. And then they have this sort of secret that, then the secret is, oh, I really like to draw, oh, I really like to this, oh, I really like to that. But it's an adjunct again to their lives. It's not a really, really important part of their lives. And when we think about how important art is, look at where we're sitting right now. An architect designed this. All these, all these paintings on the wall, not very good ones. I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, Maybe you, know, you can donate uh, one to us. Right, yeah. <laughs> what, it t what it takes to, to make that stained glass, what it takes to design all the different elements in here. There were artists who did it, um, and yet it's not important to us. So I think it's absolutely, the amount of money that we spend on museums, the amount of money that we spend going to the cinema, the amount of money that we spend going to the theater, but the, a lot of those disciplines have to struggle for validity in society, and more and more so today. Britain is much better than America. America has an antagonistic relationship with the arts. Britain has a, has a very healthy relationship with the arts. Yeah, um, picking up on that, you, you know, you're an actor, you've starred in a huge range of different blockbusters, but you don't live in LA, you don't live in Hollywood, and you actually moved to, to London. Mm. What prompted you to make this move, and what do you make of you know, being in the UK today, rather than you know, where, where family and others are based? Well, I love being in the UK. I, no one wants to be in America right now. <laughs> Not even Donald Trump's wife, I think, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, the UK, it, uh, it's, an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary place. Is, it, uh, is the government perfect? Is it functioning perfectly? No, I mean, what government does? But at any rate, you have a National Health Service, which is pretty amazing. I mean, even though there are difficulties compared to America, basically every person in this, in this room is insured from the day they're born. That doesn't happen in America. Um, the, as I said, the relationship with the arts, I think, is really important. The thought that a national theater exists is incredible, and that theater is given somewhere close to 20 million pounds a year just from the government alone. Um, your museums are, for the most part, free, unless there's a special exhibition. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, moved here, I moved here to answer your question really because my, my, my wife is British mm -hmm. and she said she would leave me. <laughs> no. we, she came and lived with us in America. I was married before my first wife passed away. Uh, I met my wife a couple years later. We started dating, she came to America and then we moved here. When you're on the set filming, do you feel it has a negative impact on your career or the jobs you're taking on not being in the community you know, of people in Hollywood or in that, in that buzz? No, no, no. Hollywood, Hollywood is only a place. It's not, a, it's, not the, it, it's not actually... It's only a thing. It, Hollywood is everywhere. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no such... I mean, you can be there and want to be in that sort of scrum of meetings and all that stuff. I have no interest in that. Luckily at this point, after 30 some five years in show business, I can sort of live wherever I want. And that's nice. But you have to remember too that England has been hosting Hollywood films for many, many years now. If you think about so many of the um, uh, Marvel movies, if you think about the Star Wars movies, if you think about a lot of independent movies um, and a lot of other studio movies, they shoot in England because England has great incentives and they have incredible crews and access to actors in England and in Europe. So it ends up being um, uh, really sort of positive economically for Hollywood to film here. So very, actually very few movies are made in LA anymore, okay. mostly television. Yeah, well, I know that for my acting career now. Yeah, um. <laughs> so if ever you, you know, yeah. you don't have to go anywhere, you can sure. just stay well, I'll be here. fine in Macclesfield, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, so, <laughs> you've um, taken on a really diverse set of roles, you know, you're a character actor, you've done everything from being Nigel in Devil Wears Prada to being, you know, a police inspector um, in, in Fortitude. What is it that you look for in um, scripts or when different jobs come up that, that really excites you and makes you think this is a project I want to take on? <laughs> Well, sometimes it's, just, sometimes it's about the role. You know, how much, how much depth is there on the role? Is there something you can seek, sink your teeth into? And sometimes it's about location um, because you, you just want to stay home. Or you think, oh, well, that would be great to shoot in blah, blah, blah. That'd be fun. 
Uh, and sometimes it's about the director, sometimes it's about the film as a whole, and sometimes it's about money. Sometimes you take a job for money because you have to make money. And do you still, are you still in that position today? When you think of course, I need to pay yes, this I have bill, a mortgage, so. you know, I have to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not cheap living in bonds. No, it's not, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, okay, exciting. Um, what, what, do you say, what would you say is the most satisfying um, role that you've taken on up to now? What's the most, you know, well, project? Well, roles really are satisfying in different ways. A comic role is incredibly satisfying because it might be very physical or very, well, comedic, and that's really fun to, to do and to make people laugh is a great thing. Um, other, other roles are satisfying in other ways. I think that uh, doing something like The Lovely Bones was satisfying because I felt I, I pulled off something that was a very difficult thing to pull off. Um, and it was a very painful process to, to do that film, to play that role. Because um, uh, you're, you're dealing with the character, the character where I played, if you haven't seen the film, a, 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 a child a molesting serial killer. Um, and I wanted it to be a, con this is a terrible joke, but I won't. The, the, the idea of this, playing this character was incredibly uh, daunting. Because the thing is, you can't just make him sort of evil and some sort of monster. He's a human being. And the more human you make him, the more, ter the more terrifying he is. And the more believable he is. So that's, the, that's really the, the goal. And that's hard, it's hard, yeah. it's hard. It's, Sort of unnerving. Okay. Um, away, from, away from acting, you're also, and art, you're a very keen chef. I know, you know you've released two cookbooks, mm -hmm. and you, you continue to be on the board of directors for the, the food bank um, in New York. Yeah. Where did your love of cooking come from, and how do you still find time to do this, you know, between all the promos and all the shoots you're doing? It, it came, my love of cooking came from my, my, my parents, my mother in particular. She's a great, great, great cook. And, um, I made a movie a long time ago called Big Night that, was, that ended up sort of being this sort of food, foodie movie, which we never anticipated it would become. It was about two brothers running a restaurant in the 1950s, and this sort of struggle between commerce and art, art being the, the, uh, the art of food. And I love, I, I love food. As an Italian, food is really the only thing that kind of really functions really well in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what you mean? Like everything else is kind of like mm, that doesn't really work. That doesn't, well, that's, mm. And people go, let's go to the restaurant, and the restaurant functions perfectly. <laughs> it's incredible. Um, so there, it is a it is um, a huge part of their culture. It is it's, it's a huge part of their cultural identity, and therefore and therefore mine. Um, and I just became more and more interested in it as I got older, partly to preserve uh, familial heritage and cultural heritage, but also because it's, it's pretty fucking fascinating. I mean, it really is when you really start to dive into, if you just look at the regions of Italy alone, the diversity of food is astounding. And it's really fun. It's hard work to put together a cookbook, but it's incredibly satisfying. Mm -hmm. When's the next cookbook going to be out then? I, I don't know. I've been talking about doing a cookbook and like a sort of travel log, but that would that would combine food, food and art in different regions of Italy, but quite specifically, maybe even picking like a single piece of art and then talking about the food of that certain dishes in that city. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of setting up your own restaurant? Or yeah, but that would be a disaster. <laughs> You wouldn't have to cook yourself. No, I know. Just put your name on the Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe someday, yeah. Yeah, okay, exciting. Um, and you've, um, you know, one of your other projects very recently was Beauty and the Beast. Um, later this year, you're going to be on the next Transformers installment. What's the next big project that you're about to set your teeth into? That you, what's the next challenge you're really looking forward to? I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I have this movie that I directed about Giacometti that's coming out, so I have to do press for that. I've been talking about directing plays here in, in London. Um, and there are two movies, but I can't really speak of them because I'm not quite sure what, yeah. if they're actually going to happen in, in um, this summer and 
and in the fall. Mm -hmm. What's the gear change like, you know, directing behind a camera and then moving towards directing in a small theatre? Do you, do you, what, what kind of technical differences do you feel really single the two out from each other? Well, there's more moving parts in, a, in making a film, although the films I make are very small. You know, they're, they're really small independent films with little, with little budget, so you can only have so many moving parts. It's not like Transformers, which is a $300 million film. I, I can't even fathom directing something like that. But, um, and directing the theater is really, in essence, it's all kind of the same. The film is just more technical, that's all. But I, the directors are, the actors are directed the same, the, the, ide the ideas and the, um, the aesthetic is the same. Okay, great. Well, um, let's take a few questions from the audience, if you have any. I'm sure there are lots of budding fans in here. Um, so if you would like to offer a question, uh, please raise your hand, uh, wait for the microphone to reach you, and please keep questions brief as well. Um, let's go to the, the person in the corner there behind the, the table. Hi there. Um, I have a somewhat self-interested question because I'm in a play that opens tonight, but I'm wondering if you have any um, pre-show rituals or pre-filming, um, I don't know, things that you like to do or say? Before going on stage, I always did the vocal warm-ups that I was taught, which was the Linklater method of voice and, you know, sort of releasing the voice that we studied for too many years in university. And, and relaxation exercise is always that. And I think your play opens tonight. It'll be a great show. Tomorrow night is the night you have to worry about. Because you'll have a great show tonight, and then tomorrow night you'll anticipate that it will be exactly the same as it was last night, the night before, and it won't be. So tomorrow night is what you need to worry about. <laughs> so just, so tomorrow night, just go out there and don't try to recreate what you did the first night. Just go out there and tell the story and you'll have a good show. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Right, let's, uh, next question. Let's go to the hand in the corner over there. Hello, good evening. Um, I was just wondering, has there ever been a movie that you really, really would have liked to make in the past? Was like, this is the movie I would have loved to be in. Would I've loved to have been in as an actor? Um, yeah, I think there, there are quite a few of them. You know what I watched recently was Marty Scorsese's The Departed, which is a really interesting sort of almost ungainly kind of, uh, but that, was a, that to me is a really interesting movie, that the, the complexity of those relationships. That would have been nice, but of course he wasn't interested in me, so. I, you know, thanks for asking that painful question. <laughs> would I like to have my hair back too? Yes, I would. <laughs> right, let's have some more um, uplifting questions, please. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, we've got a volunteer here on the second row. I always love hearing about people's role models and advocates. I wondered if you'd share a story with us about someone who opened a door for you in your career. I think my father is my biggest role model because he's a, he's a wonderful creative mind but has a great sense of discipline uh, and, and understands the everyday. Uh, he's not... Um, he doesn't live his life like, like a, a, a bohemian, the way Giacometti lived his life, which is quite self-serving in a way. But my dad was incredibly creative and, and also very generous and, and giving. So him, yeah. And Buster Keaton. I like Buster Keaton. I never knew him, but I like him. I do too. Yes. Great, okay. Yeah, um, let's go to the, the person third along over here. Hi, um, what advice can you give actors who are researching to play a real person? For example, how do you prepare for your role as Jack Warner in Feud, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, 
Well, having played a number of real people, alive and dead, um, you know, you can't just sort of do an, well, you can't just sort of end up doing an imitation of them. You have to get the uh, sort of the essence of them. Um, and, you, and you just have to be as truthful to them as possible. And if they were really evil or really sort of unsavory, then don't be afraid to do that. Don't try to be, um, don't try to get the audience to like you. Most likely the reason you're, you're, th that character exists is that we need to see that character in, in whatever piece is because there's something about them that's captivating and we want to watch them. So I wouldn't whitewash anything. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there any figure alive today or historical that you really want to play? You think you'd... Groucho Marx. Do you have a script? <laughs> we'll, get one, we'll get one cooked up for you. Um, right. Yeah, uh, over there in the colored t-shirt. Hi. Um, you played uh, Herb Kazaz in Bojack Horseman who had uh, cancer and you made jokes as that role about played, cancer. What, say it again. In Bojack Horseman you played a man who had cancer and you oh. made jokes about you know, the cancer as that role. Yeah. And you've also played you know, a child molester, a, a child killer. Yeah. I wondered if there's any limits to what you would play, considering that it doesn't reflect on you as a person but as an actor, is there any limits that you would have about the characters that you play? No, it just depends on how it's written. If it's written well, like the Bojack Horseman stuff is really funny. Um, and Peter Jackson's, the script that they had written was very beautiful. It was a beautiful story. So it was a story about love and loss, precipitated by the actions of the character that, that I played. But the character was also very well written. So that's fine. If it's not well written, then no, you don't do it. Do you know what I mean? Then it's, that's the limit to me. I think also repeating things. I have no interest in playing a child molester again. <laughs> no, no thanks. No. Hmm. Great. Okay. Yep. Another question? Yeah. At the end of the row over there, the aisle seat, the microphone will appear behind you. Oh, you've got, you've got it ready. Oh. I was just wondering, um, what would be your advice to actors starting out in terms of balancing um, a role that's going to make you money but a role that's not very well written like how how would you say you have to play that balancing act between making money and doing stuff that you know keeping your integrity well you could the the most you can do and it's easier as you sort of you get older you can sort of make suggestions and work with the director or the writer usually the director on how to how to make it better um or you make the decision just not to take the role and starve. Um, you just, you know, you, you have to also look at the players involved and who, and if you feel that these people are going to be collaborative. And if they're collaborative, then you can get to some place that isn't that terrible script that, that you've read. Do you know what I mean? But a lot of times, those experiences can be really, really useful. Having to figure out ways to say bad dialogue can teach you a great deal. And then maybe you walk away with a little money. And then that little bit of money in the bank will allow you to then go and do the thing that you really want to do. Uh, whether it is creating your own thing or finding something that somebody else has done that's, that's small and, and well written. It's, it's, it's always a balancing act. It's, it always is. Thank you. Um, yeah, at the very back there, behind the camera. Hi. Um, are there any concrete ways you can think of um, in which your passion for visual arts and things like architecture have informed and changed your filmmaking and maybe made you stand apart from filmmakers who didn't have that passion? Yeah, it, 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 inf it informs my filmmaking in the way I choose to... Well, the way I, vi the way I visualize a film. The palette that I that I choose when making the film, I'm very specific about um, the palette in every film, and and how that how that comes in how that comes into play regarding every department. So from production design to costume design to to the DOP, um, 
uh, comp the composition of a shot. I mean, looking at the Raphael show today at the uh, Ashmolean, it's, it's, it's always beneficial. And sometimes you don't even know why these, why you're looking at these things. And then suddenly you're, you're about to direct a scene, you go and you have to get this image, this flash comes to you about something that you saw, a Piero della Francesca painting or something, and suddenly you go, oh, I know what this is supposed to be. I know how those people are supposed to sit at that table. And, it, and it'll just be a flashback to this image that you saw. So it's absolutely crucial. In some ways, I find it more helpful to look at, at visual art than I, do, uh, to, than I do looking at films. I find it sometimes more informative. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, the, um, the hand over there. Good evening, thank you. I, uh, I just wanted to know what your funniest moment on set was. I don't know. <laughs> it was probably so inappropriate that I can't tell you. <laughs> um, I don't, oh, well, hmm. It's fine, uh, we can redact it from the record. No, no, yeah. <laughs> redact it from the minutes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, well, one of them was sitting with, they did this movie called Julia and Julia with Meryl Streep where she played Julia Child, and I played her husband, Paul Child, and we had to just do this little scene where they had to take some photographs of us that were turned into postcards that Julia and Paul sent to their friends, and we had to sit in a bathtub together. And the, the, it was when they were supposed to be living in Germany someplace, like Heidelberg or something like that. And for the entire afternoon, we spoke in cheap German accents. <laughs> and never stopped laughing. The crew couldn't wait for us to get out of there, I think. <laughs> that was great fun. And you're like, you're like half naked, so, you know, that makes it even sadder, I guess, doesn't it? <laughs> right, that's not too bad. Yeah, um, yeah. In the front here. Hi, um, I'm a huge fan. Thanks. Um, I always love movies that makes me feel like um, that all the cast really enjoy being in that film. So I was wondering if there's any movie that really stood out, stood out um, as being really fun. Well, I think um, The Devil Wears Prada, without question, we all got along so well, and now Emily is my sister-in-law. So that's nice. <laughs> and we still get along. Uh, I think Julie and Julia, again, that was really just me and Meryl. So that doesn't really count. Um, um, uh, yeah, there are lots of movies where, that you do and you just, you know, even if the project isn't great or even if it isn't, you know, particularly well written as the young woman was saying before, you know, actors have a tendency to, to have a great way of just sort of all coming together and, and complaining in the most entertaining way. And I find that, I find that incredibly satisfying. It sounds terrible, but sometimes the best experience on a film is when everyone's in the makeup trailer complaining. <laughs> and then you can go out and sort of fight your, you know, your bourgeois battle. But having, I did this movie called Jack the Giant Slayer. That was a really sort of long, convoluted shoot without, it was quite disorganized and everything. And I remember going into the, Ewan McGregor was, was in it and Eddie Marzan and just going into the makeup trailer and there'd be this sort of exhausted quiet in the morning, like seven in the morning or whatever it was, you know, just sort of sitting there quiet. Everyone's so tired. And then you hear one person go, you know what I hate? <laughs> Usually that was me. And then, and then it just goes. You know when he does that thing? I mean, why did he ask me to do that? That's ridiculous. So it's that. that, that that's the kind of, there's a camaraderie that, that happens with, with actors. And it's, there's something really wonderful about it. I always say, oh, I want to retire. I don't want to do this anymore. But one of the things, if I ever were to retire, I would really miss that, that camaraderie. Like when you do a play, after you do a play, sometimes the most exciting thing about the play is where are we going to eat after the, where are we going to eat afterwards, you know? 
and you're running backstage going, I made a reservation at the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Okay, good. I pre-ordered the martini. <laughs> it's exciting. And then you get to sit there and go, that was a great show, or what about how stupid that audience was, you know? <laughs> As though they were, you know. <laughs> Is there somebody you particularly enjoy moaning with who's really good at complaining or really... Yes. Uh, my friend Tony Shalhoub, with whom I've done a lot of things, he's in the last movie I directed, he's a, he's a good complainer. And I love to, com and Ewan McGregor, because Ewan McGregor will let me complain uh, so much, and he just starts laughing a lot. <laughs> so I have a great audience. Great, yeah, let's take another, another question. Um, yeah, back, back there, yeah, next to the wall. Yeah, you, looking around. Hi, Hi. I was just wondering if there are any uh, particular directors you've especially enjoyed working with, and if that's uh, uh, influenced you in your directing in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I worked with Alan Pakula a long time ago. He died a number of years ago, quite a few years ago now, um, in a terrible uh, accident. But, uh, you know, he directed, um, uh, he directed All the President's Men, he directed um, uh, the, oh God, it's just, The Pelican Brief is the movie that I did with him. And he was such an interesting, interesting director. His, his, you know, he really loved master shots, and I'm a big fan of master shots. And, and so it was a great lesson working, working with him. He had huge budgets, too, so he could sort of kind of do whatever, whatever he wanted. Woody Allen was very interesting. I directed Woody Allen in the second movie that I directed, which was not a particularly good movie, but Woody was very good in it. And then I acted in a movie that he had directed. And he was the sort of opposite of what I thought he was going to be. I thought he was going to be much more engaged with the actors, and he, he could, have really cared, could have cared less. So that was sad. Um, Steven Spielberg was amazing because his mind is pure cinema. And so he understands, he understands cinema like nobody else. He understands how to construct a film like nobody else. Uh, and he moves very, very quickly too, which I, which I really, really like a lot. Um, and Tom McCarthy, I think, doing, who did Spotlight a couple of years ago. Um, Tom, is, Tom is wonderful because Tom is, Tom is an actor, and a really wonderful actor. He's a stage actor, he's a film actor. Uh, he writes and he, and he directs. So he does everything and he comes at it from all those different perspectives. So Tom is probably one of the best directors I've, I've ever worked with. Because he really understands, oh, you know what, let's change this. This doesn't work, get rid of it. Say this, do this, do this, let's do that, let's do that. Try one like this, try one like that. Because he, he knows that you have to be absolutely spontaneous, and he trusts his actors, because he is one. Sure, thank you. Um, let's go to the hand towards the back there. Uh, when you approach a character that is uh, very complex and essentially unlikable, say like a child molester, what is the process that you go through to really get into their skin and understand their motivation, what drives them? I think you just have to figure out a way. Anybody who's doing something really wrong doesn't think that they're doing anything wrong. They think that, they, kind of, they think it's normal. It's normal for them to do it. I mean, if you look at, if you, I played Adolf Eichmann a long time ago. And so you have to try to figure out how to play one of the worst people in the history of the world. And, as I said before, one of the ways you do that is, is to look at him simply as a man. And the key in the research for me was when they captured Eichmann in Argentina, when the Mossad captured him, the Israeli secret agents captured him, they captured him, he was in his house with his kids, playing with his kids in the living room, having come home from work that day. They go in, they take him away, they take him to a, like a safe house. And this Mossad agent goes in and interrogates him, which he wasn't supposed to do, while they're trying to figure out a way how to get him out of the country. 
and he starts to have these long conversations with him. And in the conversations, he says, you know, I, you're playing with your kids. He says, yes, I love, I love children. He said, you love children? Yeah, I love children. I said, well, what, what about, and he starts to cry. And he says, well, what about all those, what about all those children that you put on the trains? I mean, you put those children on the trains and sent them to concentration camps. And he says, yeah, I, I know, but they were Jewish. So there's a disconnect, a very clear disconnect. And the thing for me that, that I connected to was his love for his children. It's like you're walking down, I mean, a, another example would be, an extreme example would be, I love my father. My father is a great guy. I walk down the street, there's a really old man, my father's age, sitting in the gutter, and I walk right past him and I don't do anything. Why? I love my father. I love old men. I want to take care of my father. Why don't I help that person? Now, what Eichmann was doing was a, was a positive action. Mine is a, is a, I'm not taking a positive action. What I mean by positive action is he was actually physically taking these kids and putting, putting them on a train and getting rid of them. But there was this disconnect between a, ra a, a race of people and, and, and people people. So the thing that you cling to is the love for the children. And everything else is, you know, it's the guy who, who goes to work for ExxonMobil. And then he wants to go out walking in the park every day. And he gives money to his local park. But we know that ExxonMobil is destroying the earth with what they do. And yet he goes and he works for them every day. That's, that's, that's another example of it. So you have to find the humanity. And then he goes to work. And then he comes home and he goes for a walk in the park with his kids. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the sky. How beautiful it is. Look at the thing. Then he goes and he sells billions of barrels of oil that are going to pollute the earth. We all do it. So you have to find the, to find the soft spot in a way, I guess. Does that answer your question? I was really long-winded, I'm sorry. Do you think everybody has this human side to them? One spot, soft spot, or one part of humanity that you can find and associate with? I do, I think everybody has it. It's just, some people don't have it enough. Great, let's go to the, the hand over there at the end of the row. Yeah, that's you. Hi, thank you. Um, I thought I'd carry on um, on your discussion on the disconnect, because I thought that was really interesting. And as someone who's interested in art and film, um, one of the things that I've always struggled with is um, how you distinguish art from the artist. So for example, you mentioned working with um, Woody Allen, who has quite a controversial personal life. And I was just wondering what your opinion was on um, on engaging with, with artists who have controversial personal lives and where that disconnect could, could lie. Um, and then also like whether this can be reflected in their art or to what extent we should distinguish really between the two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I don't know, it, it really is up to the individual whether you want to work with Roman Polanski or you don't want to work with Roman Polanski. I worked with Woody before that whole thing happened, you know. Uh, you know, what do you, I don't know. It's very hard to say because we don't always have all the facts. Um, things are sensationalized. There are, but let, let's face it, if someone is really of questionable behavior, it'd be very difficult to kind of want to go spend time with them. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, let's have another question from the back row over here. Hi, um, I study fine art, and I was wondering if you made any visual art yourself? If I do visual art myself? Yes, I do, yeah. I like to draw and, and paint a bit, yeah. Sketch a bit, it clears my head. What sort of things do you like to draw? Um, just po po portraits sometimes, landscapes, stuff like that, some abstractions. Um, that's really just to, you know, time passes more quickly. It's better. It's, 
It's like fishing. <laughs> but I never catch any fish. So I find fishing incredibly relaxing, probably because I don't catch any fish. <laughs> but I find drawing the same, same way, same thing. Great. Uh, on the front row over here. Hello. I was just wondering, at what point in your life did you think this acting thing kind of fun, and how did you get started? Well, I got started when I was a kid. I, I, not acting professionally, but just like in school. I got up on stage. I don't know how old was I, like 10, 11, something like that. I got up on stage and suddenly I felt very comfortable. I felt much more comfortable on stage than I did off stage. And, and that holds true today. I feel much more comfortable sitting here in front of all of you than I would feel sitting at a dinner party with like a bunch of people that I didn't really know. I don't know any of you. Now, of course, you paid to get here, didn't you? So that helps. But I. No, I, I, I just felt more comfortable on stage. It just felt easier. And I knew what to do. Like, I instinctively knew what to do. Um, and it stuck. It just stuck. And I wish it would go away sometimes. So w what is it that makes you feel more comfortable being up here? Is it the distance with everybody? Is it being able to, you know, guide the discussion? Or Yeah, it's guiding the discussion. It's you have people who are you know, here sort of, you know, hanging on your every word, you know. You can tell when you're losing, it, losing an audience and then you have to figure out a way to get the, get the audience. Like, now nah, we just lost that guy, yeah. right? <laughs> Actually, we might have lost him. That cough didn't sound so good. The, the, there's something about, there's something about the navigating through, through the, the waters of sort of people's attention and emotions that's incredibly, satisfying and um, it's exciting because everything is just slightly heightened I think so there's a it's it's more than a little bit more than reality do you get the same feeling when you're in front of a camera and there's no audience there you know the yeah. audience was will only see this in a year yeah, or two's you, time yeah you do you do it's not quite the same but yeah you do you do and you just have to be careful that you don't try to entertain to entertain the crew do you know what I mean? Which can happen, particularly in comedies, that's what happens a lot. You're like, well, the crew laughed. You're like, well, yeah, because, you know, they're bored, you know, I mean. <laughs> Great, let's have a few more questions. Um, the person in the striped top over there. Hi, um, so combining two of your hobbies, if you could invite any character who you've played before round for dinner, who would it be and what would you cook them? But you don't like dinner parties. <laughs> no, I do like dinner parties as long as there's wine. Um, <laughs> what if I so what character I've played and what would I serve them? Oh, well, I guess I wouldn't mind having uh, the guy from The Devil Wears Prada around. <laughs> Because he was pretty funny. <laughs> and I'll serve him whatever he wants to eat. Whatever he wa I'll make it. Whatever, whatever he wants. Probably a good martini in there someplace, <laughs> too. Cool. OK. Uh, yeah, there's another volunteer on the very back row over there. Hello. Um, if you don't mind naming and shaming, who is the most difficult celebrity you've ever had to work with? And Who's why? the what? Most, most difficult celebrity, celebrity you've ever had to work with. Oh, God, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't. That would be inappropriate. Um, you mean besides Meryl Streep? <laughs> I, I can't do that. I'm afraid I can't do that. I can't. Just give me, but give me your email. I'll send it to you. You can put that, that in the memoirs in, in 20, 30 in, years' yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, once you've properly my, retired. Yeah, when they're, yeah, when, yeah. Yeah, they're published posthumously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, leave it in the will. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> let's go to the person here on the front row. So you draw very heavily on the arts, no doubt uh, influenced by your father and your own experience in this. What is something that we might be surprised to learn that you're fascinated by behind the scenes? 
Well, you know that show, my assistant, Lottie, she knows what it is. You know that show, Time Team? <laughs> Does anybody know this show? On the, look at, she looks so sad all of a sudden. <laughs> she was like, oh, he, you know, he's <laughs> such a dork. Um, I'm fascinated by stuff like that. I'm fascinated by um, archaeology, and I'm fascinated by um, what I really want to do with most of my time is go mudlarking. Do you know what that is? Where you go when the Thames is at low tide, even though it's really gross. You know, you put on your wellies and you go in and you sort of, and what you find is kind of incredible. What people have found is incredible. So that kind of stuff, I, I, I'm a sucker for time team and any, anything like that, you know. When they, they're digging through and they find like, oh look, they found this little fucking, look at that thing, you know, and they're like, oh my God, that thing. You know, and I'm like, this thing, they found it, you know. If you weren't here today, what period of time would you most want to live in? Ancient Rome, you know, the Renaissance. No, ancient Rome. 1920s. No, would be, oh, ancient Rome would be really awful if you think about it. <laughs> the more you read about it, the more you go, oh, that's horrible. Um, I, think, I, I think the 19, 1920s, 30s, and 40s are, are very interesting. In New York? Interesting. London? No, uh, London, actually. London. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was New York, but now that I'm in London, I kind of, I'm fascinated by it. Um, I think what London, particularly what London went through during the war is astounding. It's one of, the, one of the things that America doesn't really fully yet understand how devastating it, it was. Um, and the imminent threat of invasion, you know, just, <laughs> you think about how, yeah. how, how close it is. It's, it's kind of incredible. Um, so I think that was a really, really interesting time for everything, 20s, 30s, and 40s, for literature, for architecture, for, for art, um, and sir, or, or let's, let's face it too, you know, turn of the century Paris would have been pretty kind of cool. Yeah. It's not bad today though, either. No, it's not bad today. It's not bad today. <laughs> no. Great. Um, let's get two more questions. Uh, the first, um, Volunteer, let's go for the person on the aisle seat there again. Hi. Um, so when you do kind of finish with all of this and decide to retire, what do you plan to do with your time, apart from maybe picking around in the mud of the Thames? <laughs> uh, you know, I'll never retire. Who am I kidding? It's, it's a lie. It's a, it's a fantasy. I'll, I'll never be able to really retire. I guess what I'll probably end up doing is just maybe cooking more and drawing more. Um, but I'll never be able to really stop, you know, unless somebody just, unless they keep making time team and then <laughs> they just give me like the, you know, lifetime video, video, whatever, you know, DVD collection of it, then I'll just do that, you know. Um, but no, I'll I don't think I'll ever stop. Why is that? Is it just you love it so much now? Do you really enjoy the performance? Is it the new challenge every day? No, I like to create something every day. I'd like to, I think I'll end up directing more than acting. Um, acting is really how I make my money, and because I direct small films, I don't really make a lot of money doing them, so I have to kind of go and act in movies. But I think if, um, if I had my way, I would, direct, I would direct more. And the great thing is you can do that until you drop dead. <laughs> And you don't have to look at yourself age. I mean, that's the sort of weird part of it. I had to look at some clips a couple of weeks ago of movies I had made a while ago, one that I had made like 20 some years ago. And, you know, it's weird to just see yourself. Most people don't have that. We don't see ourselves age, really. In a still photograph, maybe, but even in a home video or something, it's different than when you see yourself for an hour and a half at one age, it's, and now you're another age, it just makes you want to like kill yourself. <laughs> Great, okay, let's have one final question. Yeah, let's go to the, the, the person in the second row here in the white, white top. But you wanted to ask a question too, I know you wanted to ask one okay, earlier. Okay, well yeah, you, you, you told did my me. blind spot. Right, well, I have a bonus question then. Let's a go bonus first, question. and then we'll have the bonus question. Hiya, um, thanks for coming. So. I kind of was just wondering, what, would it, what was it like to work on Beauty and the Beast? So it's singing, dancing, you're animated. It, 
was one of the most anticipated films for the past like, few years. And it's very important to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, how was it to work on that film? Well, it was great. Look, for me, it was very easy. There were a number of us, you and McGregor being one of them, and Emma Thompson. We went in for like one week. And we put on our costumes. And we did those sort of two bits at the beginning and the end, which were live action for us. Um, and the rest of it was all recorded in a recording studio. So that was done in a day. And the rest of the stuff was shot, we shot for a week. And that was it. And it was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life because we didn't really have any lines. We didn't even have to do anything. We just put on our makeup and then... Yeah, we, I didn't even dance. I just had to stand there and pretend to play the piano. I mean, it was, it was like the best job in the world. And I don't sing. So I said to Bill, who directed it, he said, I want you to do this thing in the movie. And I said, oh, great. I said, great, but I don't sing. He said, oh, come on. I would just love that. I said, no, 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 no. He said, no, come on. We're just like one little bit of a song, like a few, you know. I said, no, I won't. I said, I've had a great career for 35 years. I'm not ruining it now. <laughs> so I sang two lines very timidly uh, in a recording studio, and then that was it. And normally the character would have kept on singing and been part of that sort of ensemble in this one song, but suddenly my voice just disappeared somehow. <laughs> uh, so, but really to answer your question, it was great, great, great fun to work with Emma and Ian McKellen and, and Ewan again and, and uh, you know, Josh Gad and all this. It was just, basically we just sat around and told stories all the time. It was really fun. It's really fun. It's a lovely movie too. Lovely movie. Something you'd like to do more of? Live action movies? Yeah, I love all that. I love, I love to do that and then to do animated. I've done a number of animated movies which are, they're the greatest things in the world really fun because you get to act like a kid it sort of reminds you of why you why you started acting in a way did you want to ask something but you had a question before you said you wanted to ask me well i'm sure you're proud of all the roles that you've been in but if there was a single standout role for you that was the most memorable or that gave you the most pride which one would it be oh i don't know if there's a single one i, I don't know i'm not but i'm not proud of all of them it's a nice thought but thank you uh no, I, I, there are a number of them. I love doing The Devil Wears Prada. It was a great role you could really sink your teeth into. Um, I think doing uh, Big Night, which was the first movie I, I co-wrote and co-directed, there was some stuff in there that I really liked. I liked that role. Um, the um, Eichmann thing was, was, was really interesting and, 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 and complex that, that, and, a real, and a real challenge. It's, I, like a, I like a challenge. Otherwise, I get bored very easily. I just like to, I want, to, I want someone to make me work hard. Otherwise, it's very boring. <laughs> Great, well, thank you for that bonus question um, and answer. Um, unfortunately, that is um, all we've got time for. You know, thanks so much for coming along this afternoon. And hopefully next time you're here, you might do a live cooking demonstration. Oh, of something course. When the, when the next yeah. book's out. Yeah. But uh, please join me in thanking Stanley very much for coming this afternoon. <laughs>